Okay, good morning. How's everyone today? A nice rainy day. So I know the time's different today, starting at 9. Normally we start at 9.30, we'd end at 10.30, so I would assume we'll just end at 10. Uh, instead of trying to get to 10.30, unless you guys have a real desire to continue the discussion. We have some extra time if you want to. Um, okay, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, once again study uh, Paul's book about the J-curve. I do pray that you would uh, give us good discussion, guide our hearts and our minds to, to learn from your word, to learn from each other uh, in a way that honors you and helps us to love each other better. We pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just some uh, review from uh, last week. Uh, the chapter last week was Love Loses Control and uh, Discovering the Shape of Love. And we looked at uh, Philippians 3, 10 and 11, which says that I may know him, meaning Jesus, and the power of his resurrection, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And we asked the question, you know, does that make sense? Are we attracted to suffering? Do we want to suffer? Um, isn't it natural to, to flee suffering? Like my cat at home loves to sleep on the most fluffy, most warm and luscious blanket she can find. It's just natural for us to not want to suffer. To, we want to be warm in the winter and cool in the summer, those kinds of things. But the answer to that question is really Philippians 2, 5 to 8, which is what Paul would call the love J-curve, which does lead to the suffering J-curve. And that is that Jesus, he was in the form of God, but took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men, being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus chooses love, and in choosing love, uh, enters into a, into a world of suffering, from being the second person of the Trinity in heaven to dying on a cross. And of course, being resurrected, and that's our hope, and that's our glory. Uh, but he chooses love, and his suffering is other-centered. He's not, it's not just suffering for the sake of suffering or some strange you know, pleasure in suffering, like masochism, but it's other-centered suffering uh, that we enter into for other people's uh, benefit and for their good. So in order to illustrate that, Paul told the story of Kayla, who was a young woman who went to the Johnny and Friends camp, and uh, within a couple of days... Um, after having been receiving plaudits and, and a, some praise for her sacrifice and her service, uh, unfortunately wound up in hot water when she was accused of making a, a ill-timed and, and ill-conceived comment about one of the uh, uh, parents of one of the dis disabled children. And uh, she you know, said she never did, and the mother said she did. We got into this. There was the uncertainty of Kayla's situation uh, which was the, it was the foundation of her suffering and wanting to continue to serve in that environment. So we learned that uh, for Kayla and for us, what happens to Jesus happens to us. That's a basic biblical principle. So Kayla entered the J-curve. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, to most of us, our surprise... Paul said to her, this is your glory. And what are you talking about? And then that doesn't feel like glory to me or to probably to Kayla as well. But it, it did several things for Kayla. And one was um, it allowed her to say no to what kinds of, of things that she wouldn't want to enter into. What would be her reaction to the situation? Which would be a simple reaction or a difficult reaction. No to... Self-pity, what else? Bitterness. Bitterness, what else? Escapism, Escapism. Gossip. gossip. Anything else? A lot of things she could have, a lot of, a lot of bad paths she or we could go down. Anger, she got angry. Withdrawal, you know, I'm leaving here. You know, I gave up all my time and money. This is the thing. So all those kind of things that we, that we say to ourselves, you know, do I need this? You know, all that kind of thing. Um, but she said yes to serving cheerfully as a servant in spite of the suffering. 
so this uh, helped her to answer, and it helps us to answer many questions that arise in those kind of situations. And one of the questions that, that arises is, um, where am I? You know, suffering brings about a sense of uh, dislocation or disorientation or confusion. So uh, what's the answer to that question, where am I? We're on the J-curve, exactly. So whenever you get in a situation where you're trying to love someone, you've entered into a loving situation and suffering rebounds on, onto you, then you get, what's going on? Well, okay, let me step back. Okay, this is a J-curve. And it gives you a sense of where you are. And it gives you parameters, and it gives you a story that you can set your life into, which helps you to make sense of your situation. Because this, you know, this is... What's going on? Well, this is how the world is. This is the, the world, the fallen world we live in. Another question is, who am I? What's the answer to, the, to that question? Who am I? And this is the sinner same. Saint. What's that? Sinner and a saint. You're a sinner and a saint. That's right, exactly. That's a good answer. Yeah, we're all suff sufferers, saints, and sinners all at the same time. Um, but the answer that Kayla got was, that Paul gives in the book, is what happens to Jesus happens to us. So... What happens to Jesus? You know, he's in hand up. And the, uh, let me go to the, you know, Philippians 2 5 to 8, he's God and he comes down and then he enters the J curve. So what happens to Jesus happens to us. I mean, it's just a reflection of how the J curve works. Uh, so what should I do in the midst of my suffering? What did Kayla do? How did she respond? Did she walk away mad? Did she pack her bags and leave? What did she do? She carried on cheerfully. She carried on cheerfully, exactly. So what do I feel? Because this is all affecting our emotions, right? You've had this false accusation or you perceive as a false accusation. Um, people are looking at you kind of funny. You know, you'll walk out of your cabin or I'm not sure what they stay. I've never been to Johnny and Friends. I'm not sure where they stay. You walk out of your cabin, your dorm, and a uh, person seems to ignore you, right? Are they ignoring you because they're worried about their day? Are they ignoring you because they've heard what happened in the cafeteria? You don't know. You know there's that suffering. There's that dislocation once again. So um, what are you feeling? What's Kayla feeling when you enter into, into suffering? Feel good about it? Feel good about yourself? What are some words you can describe how she's feeling? Blech. <laughs> Meh. That's a common expression today. Meh. What else? Discouraged. What else? Grieved. It feels to me like you would be a tool being used for a purpose it wasn't supposed to be used for. Like a, like a, like a drill gun being used as a hammer. <clears throat> There's probably a word for that. I can't think of one, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. You're like in the wrong position, or you're function. Wrong, function, wrong, wrong function. Yeah, sad, lonely, depressed, everything. You know, what, what's just what she feels. So, what's the point for Kayla? What's the point of staying to serve cheerfully? But what end does that have? What does that prove about Christ, or prove about? we as believers, what difference does it make? Why should I do that? Why don't I can go home and I can have fun? Why put up with that? You know, I mean, this is all the kinds of things which we, our hearts normally spill out apart from Christ. Well, evil is master. We're, we're trying to master evil. We're in an evil situation where things have gone badly when you've tried to be loving. So it's, you know, what's going on here? Uh, by serving cheerfully, by staying, you're, you're mastering the evil that's, that's come into your world. And uh, Christ is formed in us. So we're affecting the world, but our response is also affecting us. You know, it, it, we're a different person if we go home angry than if we stay and serve cheerfully. At the end of that process, we're more like Christ versus less like Christ, right? And so you... It, it all depends on the path you take. We'll talk about the path of the story later on in, the, in this chapter. So when Paul says, this is your glory, 
and you look at those five questions, where am I, who am I, etc. Well, well, then it, it actually starts to make sense. This, this does become your glory. And it's to the glory of Christ as well. So, uh, on to chapter 15, the art of disappearing for love, how the incarnation defines love. Uh, what were some of the words and phrases that we used to describe the love, Jacob? We had a series of words that you guys came up with great terms to, to talk about that. The word that they use at See Jesus, uh, Paul Miller, is incarnate. And that's the word that comes up in the book because that's the word they use. What other words did we use to describe that? And body. And body. Yeah. Anything, what else? There's all kinds of different ways to describe how we do this. Participate. Participate. Becoming. Becoming. We also said acting out, stepping into. Incarnating, you know, getting involved, embodying Christ in a situation with other people. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, what does incarnating look like? So, let's compare two ways of incarnating, one positive and one negative. Um, let's see, Doug, could you read uh, page 129, Philippians down at the bottom there, and you need to start at the bottom. And work your way up. I was circumcised on the eighth day. You talk about the stair steps? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of piracy, as to zeal, the persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Okay, we cover this, this thing. What's this called when he's doing that? He's going up the. Failure boasting chart. Okay, so Paul, Paul the Apostle, is, starts out here. He's circumcised on the eighth day, and he goes all the way up the failure boasting chart to the pinnacle, which is blameless, which is a rather brash boasting statement, right? Blameless. It's kind of shocking that he would actually say that. Uh, so that's Paul, apart from Christ, and that's us apart from Christ, you know, generally speaking, we're all trying to find our way, if you think about it, on, on the failure boasting chart. And there's things in our lives which make us go down, and then there's ways in which we try to go up. And this is kind of the, the track we're on. And it's, of course, it's a Murray, it's not a Murray go round, but it's the same kind of a sense. It's, you know, it's a never ending, you know, back and forth effort to, uh, to prove yourself. Um, so Paul's on that track, but then, the answer to that, or the antidote to that, or the opposite of that, is let's have Steve. Could you um, read uh, page one thirty, starting with "Have this mind among yourselves." Uh, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, <coughs> who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul is, is starts at the bottom and he just goes up, 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 up. Mm -hmm. But Christ starts at the top and he just goes down, 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 down as a servant and our servant leader and as the Son of God. So starting on page 130, comparing two paths, these two stories could not be more different. Jesus' story is humble, hidden, filled with love. He reaches out to people. Paul the Pharisee's story is proud, boastful, filled with hate. He pushes people away. Jesus slowly disappears to the point of death. Paul steadily expands with the wonder of Paul. Paul uses God's law to put Paul on display. Jesus' dying love displays God. So, very, very different stories, obviously. And until Paul meets Jesus on the Damascus Road, his story is going to be this constantly trying. And of course, it ends up in murder. I mean, they kill Stephen, and he's guarding the coats and the tunics of the people that are stoning him. And what a horrific thing. And then when Paul meets Jesus, you know, that all changes. And uh, Paul starts on that road, the path, the story of becoming more uh, like Christ. 
So we see the intimate connection between going down in humility and in, in incarnation, which actually, we lose power when that happens. But we don't want to lose power. We want to keep power. It's, you know, what keeps us you know, coherent in our, in our lives is uh, increasing power and less humility, but, but the J curve wants us to lose power and increase humility so that we can be more like Christ, which in the end is, is a much better, much better thing. So the incarnation or incarnate, incarnating is a sexual move of love, but it constricts. So Paul starts talking about the um, young men and, uh, and marriage. What's he say about that? Young men and their views of marriage and their they want to float. They want to float. Why do they want to float? It's better to float than to sink. Interesting way to put it, right? So young men see that as sinking. You think so? Sinking into what? How does that sink us? That's true. That's what we don't want to do. Right. Right. We want to have options. Right. Options. When you marry, you, you give up all the other options. Right. Yeah. Well, sure. And when, if you pick the wrong option, what, what if it's the wrong, you know, it's the wrong option, then, then you've got the wrong option, right? And so young men want to float around and kind of keep above, not commit, because they want to keep their options open. Um, but, uh, it's kind of odd because most love songs don't say that that's what's going to happen, right? And uh, as I was reading through this, I thought of a of a song. It's an old song. Maybe some of you can finish the first line. Um, Frank Sinatra likes to sing this song. Anybody here know? You guys know Frank Sinatra? <laughs> <laughs> love and marriage, love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage. I don't think he wrote the song, but he sings the song. So, goes together like a horse and carriage. So it's, it seems like from Frank's perspective, he's singing the song. It's just such a natural thing, you know? That's just how it should be, and it's wonderful, and it's great. And, but at the same time, you know, apart from the love songs, for when people in their hearts, uh, especially young men, maybe some young women as well, but, you know, that commitment becomes, becomes an issue, you know, because you're narrowing down, you're constricting your life into something very specific. And it takes away a lot of other other options. Now, we're not, I'm not saying that's that's bad. In the end, that's good. But it doesn't seem like it's good. It seems like it's, it's good. Because there's a narrowing, a loss of power, a loss of control, and it opens us up to what don't we want in our lives? What does my cat not want? Discomfort. discomfort. More than discomfort. What's What else? I just want to suffer, because relationships can bring suffering. If you don't want to have suffering in your life, stay away from relationships. And whether it's a friendship or a marriage or whatever it is, or uh, you know, having a community of any kind, you know, when you become close to people, then it's naturally going to lead to conflict and suffering. But there's there's good things in that community and marriage and one-on-one and friendships, which way outweigh. There's things you need to work through, but it way outweighs. You know, the pain. So, yeah. can, can I just say, I, sure. I, I appreciate the way that he, uh, at the bottom of 131 there, that he does not, he's not talking merely about marriage or about a problem that young men have. So I like the way that he says, where he's doing this quotation, you know, he says, unless you narrow your life down to one woman, you will not mature. All right, so there's a problem for men, for young men who need to get married or need to commit themselves. But I like the next line. He says, you've got to land in a specific life to commit to love one person forever. And it seems to me that talk about specific life is true, whether you're thinking about a relationship like marriage, Mm -hmm. or whether you're thinking about a job, or whether you're thinking about a church, or almost anything you're thinking about. If you're not ready to commit to something specific, then it seems as though you will always 
just kind of float. You never get into the depths. Right. But any commitment like yeah. that yeah. means not being committed to other things. It means sure. Yeah. 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 That's that's a good point. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, you have to commit to a career, right? You want to be a carpenter, or you want to be an engineer. Well, what kind of engineering? Though it would be mechanical or electrical, chemical. Well, I got to pick one. Because if you don't, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'll try a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But then you're floating along, and you never really, you know, the chemical engineer becomes a chemical. He becomes an expert in that field, or a master carpenter becomes an expert in maybe making beautiful furniture. Well, that's a wonderful thing, but that takes work. And that's commitment, and that's narrowing, and that's all that comes down to that person excluding a lot of other things in their lives in order to make that develop. But the fruit of that is, you know, well, he's a he builds the most beautiful furniture I've ever seen. I mean, and that kind of thing. You know, it's just really interesting. Yeah. Thanks, that was, that was good. Yeah, and he says there at the end of that paragraph, when you've got to, to land, until you do that, your soul remains shallow and light. You have no weight as a person. That's a pretty powerful thing to say. Yeah, so, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> page one thirty-two: the path of incarnating. And this is a really interesting story, Richard and Lydia. Uh, this, in the counseling world, would be called a case study. And when you take the counseling courses. They give you case studies. Case studies are situations in which there's conflict. It can be a husband, wife, co-workers, boyfriend, girlfriend. You know, it's, it's different kinds of situations. Um, an interesting thing about case studies is that uh, when you when you read the first part of it, your typical response is, "I can't believe they would do that." <laughs> it's like. I'm just, I'm shocked, I'm appalled, you know. And then they give you the second piece of paper, which is the other person's perspective. And you're like, I can't believe they would do that, you know. And so you see that the stickiness, the tar baby of relational issues, when you have one person gives their side of the story, another person gives their side of the story. As an aside, my personal experience with this is in my practice, uh, you have employees and they would not always get along with each other and inevitably from time to time uh, one of them would come to me and say uh, you know this Jane said nah, and she did this and she did that and, and I'm sitting there with her in my office and unfortunately 95% of the time I made the, the mistake over and over and over again the mistake was saying I can't believe she said that to you. <laughs> what am I going to learn, right? So, because, then I would get Jane in the office by herself. And I would hear the other side of the story. And was, what's my natural inclination at that point? I can't believe Mary would say that to you. You know? So, at that point, like, what do I do? Well, you know, it's, I've got two opposing sides, and they're both equally bad. And, uh, you know, the tendency is to say, just go be nice to each other. <laughs> stop it, stop it. You know, go work. Do your job. Um, but it's hard to do your job. You're working closely with people. You're bumping up against each other. And she's supposed to do that. And said, you know, all this kind of thing. So it, it, it's very, very difficult to resolve these kinds of relational issues. It's just complicated. Because each person has their own view. And until you hear the other side, you know, what there's a biblical proverb, I forget which one it is. You know, you believe one side until you hear the other side, and then, well, then, then the fun story. You know, that's not what the proverb says, but it's along those lines. They can't both be right. They can't both. both right. <laughs> they're probably both right and both wrong at the same time, you know, it's, it's because it's always messy. Um, so, what happens in the conversation between Richard and Lydia? What's the situation? Richard is charged with being harsh. So Lydia comes to Richard and she says, I think this is a good good thing. She says, you know, I think you're you're a harsh 
You're being harsh. You're a harsh person. So uh, <clears throat> after praying and searching her heart, and Lydia's doing starts off well, she asked her husband, Richard, do you think you were harsh yesterday when you said, ah, okay. So how does Richard respond? Oh, yeah? How else does he respond? What would you call what he, what he does when he responds? Harsh. Harsh. He, he is justifies harsh. Himself. Justifies himself, meaning that he puts the blame on... He, she blame shifts. Right? He shifts the blame to Lydia. And um, by saying, well, you had it coming anyway, you were harsh too. I mean, it sounds like to like five-year-olds, you know, you did it, no, you did it too. Yeah. Um, but this is not unusual. So she, in a gentle way, I think, tries to challenge him on his harshness, and he responds angrily by sh trying to shift the blame uh, to her. Um, it's the story that they say in the counseling class. When any whenever anybody says to you, I'm sorry, but whenever you... Right? Well, that's not an apology, right? That's telling the other person why they're the problem. Because I wouldn't have responded this way if you hadn't done that. So I'm kind of sorry, not really, because actually you're the problem. So, not that there isn't an issue on the other side, as we've been talking about, but that's a different discussion. But anyway... Uh, he responds harshly. And then how does Lydia respond back? In kind. In kind. All right. So now you've got the battle. Okay. Because she responds and says, um, I'm not the problem here. You always throw things back on me, which maybe he does. You never listen and he's an idiot. So now we've started out well trying to solve Richard's harshness and we've ended up with more of the same and a deepening you know, problem with this relationship. So, how does Paul say that Lydia can handle this in a way that's um, a better way? What's a better plan for her? My temptation, firstly, would be to respond like, Lydia did, right? Well, you're the problem, and you're always harsh, and of course, you know, this is an issue. So, but how does Paul say Lydia should respond? Ask how she's harsh. What's that? Ask how she has been harsh. Yeah, how, 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 how have I been harsh? Yeah. So is that an easy thing to do? No. What, what's she doing? Humbling herself. Humbling herself. Trying to see the other person's perspective. Trying to see the other person's perspective, right? She's incarnated. Yeah. She's dying to herself. Right? He's harsh to her. And she comes back in in kindness. Okay, so she breaks the breaks that circle. Right? And so she's incarnating with him, taking that on, which is I think very difficult to do. Very hard to do. That's really a challenge. But that's incarnating Christ. That's taking the J curve. Because she's she's going down the curve. You know, he's being harsh to her. And then she asks, Well, how am I harsh? And then she's she is really dying to herself. You know, which is a difficult thing to do. Right. Yeah. Just a thought. I think it has I admit this thought was born out of um, a desire for a little bit more because incarnate is a transitive verb. Not so, uh, incarnate is a transitive verb. I'm not an object. Mm -hmm. That's where I started, I think. But um, I do think it matters because we're, we are embodied people. So everything we do, I think, incarnates one thing or another. And we're always going to be limited by being a specific person. Mm -hmm. So in this case, her choice wasn't to incarnate one God. It was to incarnate self-love or self -love. And I do think that matters because you're always going to be, you're always going to have to make a decision that leaves you in one specific circumstance or another. It's just choosing between suffering that just sucks 
and it's operating with purpose. I think mean, that's a very good point. I thought that made me Yeah, yeah. I think mean, that helps. And like you just said, you're incarnating in Christ. Right. Not just incarnating. Right. We're already kind of doing that just by existing. But what does each of our actions incarnate? Something specific. Yeah, that's true. Because we're talking about head members. A person who's in this path of the contract. Yeah. A person becomes a floater or a technical engineer. Yeah. So that, that's a person, a body, a body doing that. Yeah, and I do think that's exactly what he intended to say. Right. But right. without leaving yeah. the object off, it could mean you know, it could give you a slight understanding, I guess, of what I think is possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can you have you have two things to incarnate at every point in time, and that's kind of the point. You can incarnate the Paul who goes up to being blameless. You can incarnate the Christ who goes down to death. Right. Right. Either way, you're incarnating something. It's just which one you're incarnating. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's good. I was thinking, you know, this definition here, incarnating means to step in another person's shoes. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of thinking in terms of she was trying to be one with him. You know, but she realized that she is one with Christ at the very same time. Mm -hmm. And so if he rejects that, she still has that being one in Christ. Mm -hmm. so, right. But to be trying to be one with him is a significant thing. You know? Well, hopefully she's not trying to clone him into herself, mm -hmm. but trying to bring that unity that we all want. Right. She's not trying to clone her into him. Uh, but there is, I think, that sense that she's losing herself, you know, because um, Paul says, you know, she feels like she's um, going crazy. It seems like a crazy thing to do. It's not a natural thing for us to respond that way. It goes against our grain to defend ourselves, to not be falsely accused. I mean, that's a, and we shouldn't be falsely accused, but, but so it's a natural thing to to fight against that, you know. So she feels crazy. She feels like she's being, as Paul says, Paul Miller says, disappearing, being swallowed up. You have a harsh person in front of you who's accusing you of being harsh. You've tried hard to enter into a dialogue and they're coming back at you. And it just feels like you're shrinking. And if you respond the way she responded, well, how, you're even taking more, how am I harsh? Well, let me tell you another thing about how you're harsh. So, you know, it's, you just get more and more like you're just shriveling up. Um, like she's becoming, as Paul Miller said, becoming a non-person. And that's, that's a difficult thing. Um, but on the other hand, as he says, uh, listening to somebody does not necessarily mean you agree with them. But you are listening to them, and that's, that's a, a beginning. So page 132 to one... Uh, let me see, page 132... <clears throat> Um, down towards the bottom of that last paragraph, for Lydia. For Lydia to go in, to incarnate with her husband with a question, she has to go down. Going down and in does not mean she agrees with him. Here's Lydia's downward path. Lydia already lives with Richard's harshness, which is a suffering J curve. Contemplating talking with him is painful for Lydia. Lydia searches her heart with a repentance J curve. In other words, she says, what's my, she's thinking, well, what's my part of this? She's not thinking, you're the problem. She's, she's really honestly thinking, what, you know, what do I have to do with this? She talks to Richard about his harshness, thus entering a love J-curve. He responds by blaming her. Lydia doesn't quarrel, but she asks him how he is harsh. Given the modern mind, the downward path feels not only galling, but wrong. But Jesus lives in each one of these downward steps. So how is Lydia able to do this? This is not an easy thing. How is it possible? Spirit of Jesus. Spirit of Jesus, yeah. Anybody want to put it any other way? I'm not so happy of... Spirit of Christ. Yeah. Is that what he said? Oh. Yeah, the Spirit of Christ. Christ enables us. And we talked about that too when we were talking about the different words of embodying and incarnating. Is it, you know, the, the Spirit enabling us to be uh, somebody that we're not 
we wouldn't normally be. Um, I, I think there's, there's an element of you're, you're becoming a nobody, but you have to be a somebody somewhere. And you're saying, in Christ, I'm a somebody. You know, and I'm going to lean on that to make myself a nobody. <laughs> And I, I, as I was reading that story, I thought, I hope that I have some friends who, who will help to, if you would say, in the name of Christ, to affirm her, you know, that you're, you're not a nobody. You know? So I mean, that, that's, that's what makes it hard. You don't, you don't just go down in the hole without anyone pulling you out. You say, well, Christ is in the hole. So that's good enough. Right, you have Christ and then hopefully you have friends who can give you perspective. Because in that situation, it's hard to have a perspective. Uh, if somebody's calling you harsh and they you have self-doubt, well, am I harsh? And, but she's properly asking that question, well, how, how am I harsh? Am I really being harsh? Is that true? And, and so it helps to have good friends to, to know her and are honest with her to really say, well, Actually, no, you're really not a horse person. Or, well, sometimes, you, know, you can. You know, whatever the response is, to give her, kind of locate her, once again, relocating her to, well, who are you really? Not just what a horse person thinks about you, because their, their perspective and their view might be completely wrong. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point. So you have Christ, you have friends, and, uh, or people go to counseling, and they... they tease out what's your life and where you, what's your background, who are you, and kind of get a sense of, and help that person locate as, as well. So, so page 134, as, uh, where it says the only way Lydia, as uh, Pat said, the only way Lydia can take the path of Jesus. 133, is that right? 133, sorry. Yeah, top of 133, the only way. The only way Lydia can take the path of Jesus is if the Spirit of Jesus is in her. Later we will see that the Spirit gives us the gift of Jesus' heart, which wants to us to go lower for love. Like Jesus, Lydia has to pray her way through the conversation, asking for grace to listen, to ask good questions, check her anger, and to forgive. Like Jesus, she realizes, I cannot do anything by myself. Richard's harshness drives her into the mind of Christ. She hears Jesus better because Richard doesn't listen. To summarize, Lydia's husband responds harshly to her gift of honesty. She receives his harshness as a mini-fellowship of Christ's suffering, which allows her to incarnate. By incarnating, she prevents a quarrel, helps her husband with a good, honest word to penetrate his heart, the cost the pain of humility. She loses her voice with Richard, but gains Christ's voice as she displays honesty, gentleness, and humility. Far from being a codependent, she boldly goes into dangerous territory, harsh people respond harshly to honesty, and plants a seed. She doesn't try to win, and she receives the death that comes with love. Just because someone refuses your honesty does not mean it wasn't a good gift. Jesus never measured his honesty by how people perceived it. What's that last sentence? Jesus never measured his honesty by how people received it. Huh. Is there any responses? Any thoughts on how Paul handles the case study in terms of how he thinks Lydia should respond and what are the fruits of her? A different response? Let's talk about that. I just had a thought of when Jesus went to the woman that was possessed. So everybody was looking at her as being possessed and they were focusing on that. But Jesus went and he actually saw her, who she could be, who he created her to be. So it's like it's like a trajectory or like a paradigm shift mm -hmm. when you say Okay, so Richard's harshness may not be who he really is, right? It's a, it's a behavior, it's an external whatever. But as she seeks to really understand 
it can bring down some walls and it can say, oh, no, you're actually interested. So I think Jesus, again, is the model of relationship. He came to us not to, to save us from hell, but because he wanted to live with us. So that model Christ gave us of living in relationship, living in fellowship with one another. So that, that paradigm shift for us on the J curve helps us to identify greater with Christ in his suffering, in his personhood. So I don't know if that makes sense to how I'm seeing it, but. Yeah, I, that's a lot of good stuff there. The only, the only thing I would um, want us to talk about is, is his harshness, you know, you said that's not who he really is. But is that who he really is? I think it's a, um, kind of like if a dog is hurt and you reach out and they, they mm -hmm. lash out at you. It's not really who they are, they're hurt, right? And that's their lash. So is he being harsh because of some something else going on? So to see underneath the harshness is a symptom of a, a deeper problem. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I mean. Any hey, thoughts on that? Bring in your what? Harvard, I'm thinking of him in Harvard. <coughs> oh, in Harvard, yes. Yeah, right. yeah, Mike Hamlin, okay, I just read something by him. He was doing a case study, and he was, I guess he was on that live broadcast they had recently, and Mike Hamlin, and they had a situation, the guy was really out of, you know, also, how do you say it, in the wrong. And Mike and his co-worker, or maybe he was even his roommate, decided, mm -hmm. Well, this guy's not coming back to do that last year. But then in class, his professor said, No, like you're saying, you know, this man, if he can't bear this man's pain some, there's no way you're going to reach him. So I'm using Mike Emmett's name in the sense that, yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> Who is Mike Emmett? He wrote uh, Sinners, Fakes, and Suffers, I think, from uh, CCC. Yeah. yeah. But the other thing I thought, Larry, is that her actions, and it goes both ways, you know, Jesus' behavior is what broke Paul, he said to you, you know. But it doesn't always work that way. Sure, yeah, it doesn't. Uh, yeah. I still want to burrow down into is Richard really harsh? I mean, you said there's a. There's a deeper reason for it. Is what? What's the deeper? He's harsh. So is that really who he is or not? Um, Maybe it's who he's become. He's become or practicing it or whatever. But, but then he is that way. Right. So what's what's the underlying? Like something else. You said something else is going on that is producing that. What what is that? What, what would that be? Harshness, uncaring self. I mean, fill in the blank of what any kind of sinful behavior. Could be his own insecurity. Insecurity? Where's their where's their insecurity come from? Oh. I'm gonna keep drilling down. Lack of proper identity in, in who Christ made us to be made. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah. Yeah. What else? Keep drilling, keep drilling. Total depravity. Total depravity. He's a Christian, it is who he is, and it's also not who he is. And um, like you know, I think of Paul saying, Don't think that you can do what I don't want to do. Right. It's right. me, it's right. not me. It's right. the Already and not yet. Right, right. So we're sinners. He really is that way, but then again, it's a product of his sinful nature. So in a sense, it really is who we are. So we don't want to say, well, if we're, if, if we're incarnating with somebody in love, is that who I really am? <laughs> None of us wants to say that. that we're not, well, I'm not really a loving person. That's just some kind of... Well, no, that's, that is Christ's love coming out through me, and I am being loving. Uh, but like Mike Hamlet would say, we're all sufferers, saints, and sinners. And that all impacts who we are. We all suffer, and we all, we're all saints in Christ, but we act lovingly sometimes, and we're sinners as well. We're all, we, are, we are those things. We don't just appear to be those things, that's, we are those things. So just wanted to kind of drill down a little, a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. This may take you on a path you don't want to go, so take it. Well, we're just going to talk about this. Next section. When I think about incarnate, my first thought when two chapters talk about incarnate is what Lydia is trying to do is she is trying to ask a question that diffuses the situation and enters into Richard's heart 
by asking Kala Maharaj. So she is trying to, in that sense, incarnate into his life the way Christ came into our world. Now that isn't the way he takes it, but I wonder if I wonder if that is a part of it that by asking Richard that question and allowing him to spew his venom toward her, if he will, at least she gets insight into who he is and knowing who he is and what his experience is. That leads to what the book was saying. Then you find out what's going on in his life. And that kind right. of incarnating. That doesn't seem to be what Paul is getting at, but that's another kind of incarnating, sort of an empathizing. Yeah, that's true. So if she says, how am I harsh? And he just spews out a list of ten things of how she's harsh. What do you do with that? Yeah. Ask more questions. Ask more questions. Okay. That keeps it diffused. And at that particular moment, in that particular discussion, you may not get, seem like you get very far. It just might seem like you just, the dump truck just kind of, you know, just dumps on her. Uh, that's a hard thing. But that's that's the suffering of the love Jesus. I think that's part of it. One other thing, like I think, yeah. Yeah. In, our, in our culture now, you know, we have the idea of the image of God, but that's being thrown out in our culture mm -hmm. so that you know the person is simply an oppressor, and you know, and then there's really no one, and so that's what they call it critical theory, I guess, mm -hmm. something like that. So that image of God in that man himself. You know, this guy, this Richard, there's hope for him, you know, because he's not just an oppressor and that's all he's ever going to be, you know, and therefore you got to get rid of him or whatever. Cancel. Yeah. Cancel. That's what our culture is. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, we could go down the yeah. long path with that. We won't, but mm -hmm. but you're, you're right. What you're perceiving in the culture is, uh, you know, one bad thing defines a person. Um, and then, uh, what do you do with that? You, you want to get, you want to make the culture more pure, so you get rid of that. And there is no forgiveness. That's the problem. There's no sense of all the forgiveness uh, or redemption. Yeah. Just a thought. Yeah. So sure. Yeah. Responding in her kindness, mm -hmm. and you know, saying, "Well, how am I harsh?" She is responding in her kindness, and what's the guy's name? Anyway, her husband. Richard. To turn the lights on <clears throat> in his sin and end of the day curve to see it more clearly, like what he has got going on inside of him. Yeah, I, th I think you're right about that. Yeah, yeah. And I think her response in that way, if she says, Well, how am I harsh? He's probably expecting the initial scenario. Well, you're, you know, and then she responds in a negative way, which leads to the, to the argument. Um, but if she responds, how am I harsh, like you're saying, you know, that, I'm sure, that has to have an impact on you. Maybe not yeah. immediately. Not immediately. Yeah, but she's changed the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? She's, she's, she's changed the dynamic. You know, she's changed the, the paradigm. But it seems to me that there's no guarantee. No, right? no guarantee. Right? So it's no guarantee. Saying that's that's got to have an effect. And I know that it does. But the effect sometimes is I hunker down all the more in my harshness. Right. Right. So right. Right. Jesus being kind did not ultimately sway Caiaphas. You know? Yeah, yeah, he responded well and they uh, killed him anyway. Right. There's a death there. Yeah. You know, I was thinking that, uh, you know, basically, you said um, she lost her voice because she was being humble and listening and, you know, and that's, I think, part of the suffering. You know, the, the whole reason for all this to help that other person, their relationship, and, of course, leading to Christ or whatever needs to be done. And in those situations, often, you, you do kind of leave, you know, you lose your voice and you feel like you're not helping anything. You don't know what, you know, if it is positive in the end at all, you know. And that's part of suffering, I think. Yeah, disappearing. Yeah. Feeling like you're stuck in the But for even the, the purpose of Christ is disappearing because you're, you know, nothing seems to be happening and now all of a sudden you're just the listener and not speaking into their life. Right, right, right. Like, I don't want to be a doormat, right? I mean, we'd say that as well. 
Nobody listens. Well, just walk all and say walked all over me. I mean, that kind of, I mean, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and like you don't see the change that you had hoped to see in that situation, you know, for price fit. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's, that's good. Yeah, I mean, it's good. Can I just put it in one other way? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. It's just what Abby's yeah. talking about too. I think this is exactly right. It, it's it's not that I respond gently in order to produce a result in Richard. It's right, responding gently can't be merely a strategy that I use, right? One strategy is to smack in, and another one is to respond gently. All right, which one's gonna work better? The question is, which one is like Christ, right? So it really is entering more deeply into Christ, whether or not it will ultimately produce the result I want to produce, right? So I think of the proverb of kind word turns away wrath. Would you say that that's kind of the result producing power? Hmm. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose I would say that. It's a generalized proverb, as all the proverbs are. And so I think, in a certain sense, it is a, a good, it, it's a good strategy. But I guess my point is, it seems to me that if it's merely a strategy, then I'm not, it's not clear that I'm really becoming like Christ. Becoming like Christ is the ultimate end, and of course that has effects. That's a, that's a good strategy, but you don't use you don't do that because of the strategy. You do it because of Christ. Yeah, you have it's to, a very subtle thing. You have to die to your hope of what you think is going to happen in response to what you do, and you have to say, "I'm doing that because it's like Christ, and it may lead to my crucifixion, and that's okay." Now that's tough, and that's why I said she has to have people around her. I, I think I would be completely disoriented in that situation, or it would be completely disorienting. I have to have somewhere, you know. Obviously, Christ holds you up, but you have to have somewhere to find yourself, like Caleb. Um, you know, but it's not just for a week now. This is my husband. Right. We're in a co-op mall, and and if if. And I'm not to put my hope on the results I'm going to get. I'm going to put my hope on becoming like Christ in the moment. And every moment thereafter, no matter what the outcome is, I pursue this path because it's the path of Christ. Well, that's, that's tough. It well, is tough. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I think that question that she asks, you know, how have I been merged? That needs to come from a place of not just like, okay, my strategy is to be the disarmament this how I've been harsh. It needs to be from a place of like, okay, I am the worst sinner in this room. Tell me how I've been harsh so that I can fix that. Because I'm a sinner and I'm broken. I think that's that's where that question can come from. Not from a strategy or something. That, like, God's way of that too. Right, you could have a strategy that has bad reasons for the strategy. I just wish he would be quiet. I just want a peaceful life. I just want what I you know I don't want to have to deal with it. So you have a strategy that all, all for reasons that are not for Richard's best interest, for changing Rich and wanting Richard to come to a realization of, of knowing Christ's love as well. So, so I mean, it, it gets much deeper, more complicated, even. But thanks for bringing that up because that's that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Ken, thanks too. That's that's a good a good comment. Uh, as you were talking, uh, Denise, about. Um, she doesn't want to disappear. Has anybody ever seen the movie On the Waterfront? Famous Marlon Brando movie from the 50s. Frank Sinatra and Marlon Brando. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well read. <laughs> Marlon Brando plays a, a boxer. On the water, he's a water, he's a stevedore. He works on the, on the docks, you know, moving stuff around from the ships. And uh, But his sideline, he's a boxer. He's a very good boxer. Um, but he gets like a lot of boxing, not all boxing, I'm sure, but gets involved with the mob. And the mob will pay him to take a fall. In other words, lose a fight on purpose. And uh, his brother is involved in this. Uh, he's involved in the mob, and he gets his, Marlon Brothers character, I forget his name in the movie, um, to take a fall, and he's losing. And of course, if he keeps winning fights, he'll move up the, the ladder, and eventually he might become the middleweight or heavyweight champion of the world, who knows. Um, but uh, in, in, the, in a car ride, 
um, his brother decides to turn against the mafia, and then uh, Marlon Brando berates him for having forced him to uh, fall down for these fights. And he says, you know, the famous line is, you know, um, to remember the whole thing, he says, um, to the effect that I could have been somebody, right? I could have been a I, I could have been a contender. <laughs> C-U-N-T-N-D-A-H. Contender. <laughs> old. Yeah. Long um, But if you actually watch, you know, when you hear people quote the line, it's, I could have been a contender for contender. But when you actually watch the movie, it says, I could have been somebody. And that's a whole different emphasis. And what you're saying is, I want to be somebody. I don't want to be nobody. I want to disappear. You know, I could have been a heavyweight champion. You know, you that kind of sense of... And so for Lydia to say, how am I harsh? That's just like, you know, for Christ. Which is totally opposite of what the world, you know, wants uh, us to do. So uh, I did want to get on a little bit. Well, there's one question I did want to cover here, which is an important question. We hear this saying, does anybody have to go pick up children? Or? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be fine. Yeah. The question, and we're almost, we're almost done. <clears throat> the question is, is it true that whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Only if you stay in Vegas. Only if you stay in Vegas. <laughs> Why is that? You always bring yourself with you. You always bring yourself with you. That's right. So when you go to Vegas and something bad happens, then it changes you as a person. You don't come back the same person. So it doesn't stay in Vegas. You know, if you go and you have an affair or you start drinking and you act badly, you, you come back that person who did that. And uh, it's not true, and we need to. You know, your, your life takes a certain trajectory, and how you live today depends on how you lived yesterday, and you take different trajectories depending on the choices that we make. You know, so kind of goes along with what you're saying. A few years ago, in Las Vegas, I saw a magic show, and the magician said, "Just remember, what happens in Vegas stays on Facebook." So. <laughs> <laughs> A good point. Yeah, a good point. So, uh, so and he tells that in the in the, uh, in the context of of a story. You know, the story of the Bible is a story of redemption. It's a narrative, and it teaches us something about God, about Christ, about our lives, and who we are. And stories are very, very powerful. And uh, it's a wonderful way to 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 think about life and to think about how we we, we do life. Um, I see people are getting kind of ready to go, but but uh, so um, a story that I read recently. This is an aside. Has anybody ever read Wendell Berry? Wendell Berry is a wonderful author. There's a short story, "Pray Without Ceasing." I highly recommend it because it's a wonderful story about forgiveness. And I could read five theology books on forgiveness. It wasn't as powerful as reading this story that he wrote about forgiveness. It's just a wonderful way. Of it. So stories are powerful. And the Bible is a story, a story of redemption. It's very powerful for us. So to summarize, um, each life is a trajectory. And four things to think about that help us to, to think that through. Um, what I do today shapes who I am tomorrow. We take life one step at a time so we don't get overwhelmed. The culture is telling us to choose a path. You can choose the idea of the different drummer. You can be the captain of your own soul, right? Both of which are bad paths, I think. Uh, but you can use the path of Christ or the path of yourself. And that's very, very general, but I think it's true. And the path of Christ is the path of the J curve. This is when you enter into love, we enter into suffering, and that's which may wind up in our death, right? But that's, that's what the J-curve is. So it's Christ's path. I don't need to try to control it. 
uh, as Paul Miller says, it's the valley of the shadow of Richard, <laughs> which is what it is for her. Uh, but Christ sets a table before us and will dwell in his kingdom forever. Any other questions that you guys have? There's a great chapter, a lot of blood in there. A lot of stuff to uh, study and learn. Any other thoughts? I said one thing when you guys were sure. all talking. Yeah. Um, the bottom of 134, it talks about he's asked multiple audiences to define holiness. No one has mentioned the idea of the journey or of Jesus' path, which is that done. If you miss the story character of our call to follow Jesus, you'll drift into depersonalized moralism and legalism, which obeys the law but focuses on self and its satisfaction. You'll miss people. And that, that is Jesus' whole right. message is relationship. I came so that you may have a relationship right. with me. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was yeah. powerful. Thank you. Great way to end. Yeah. Doug, could you close this in part? I'm going to follow what he's saying again for it. Uh, it's time where we can uh, learn how we as, a, as simple creatures often look at a, a direction opposite to uh, what you teach us, what you instruct us, uh, not only by your word, by the example shown by uh, Paul, <coughs> Edgar's conversion, and certainly by the word of Savior Jesus Christ. God, would you uh, give us parts that are humble um, parts that uh, allow us to see um, the, the end from the beginning that is the end being a, a resurrection from the the you know the hurts and the uh, and the uh, setbacks and things that life uh, sends our way but seeing that uh, in, uh, living for uh, Christ by being uh, humble by being patient by um, incarnating incarnating ourselves into the lives of others mm -hmm. uh, that, that we too can can arise um, uh, in this uh, this mortal existence in the same way that our risen Lord and Savior rose for our salvation. Mm -hmm. So God, uh, uh, this day is a uh, a day where we celebrate um, our Savior's uh, triumphal entrance into Jerusalem, only to uh, to die a, a terrible death um, as we go through this uh, uh, this upcoming week on. Uh, uh, on Friday, and yet we seek, we can see the end from the beginning and the uh, glory that comes uh, this day, a week from now. Mm -hmm. So, God, give us a heart that are in tune with the word and uh, the fact of uh, our, uh, our Savior and uh, help us to be uh, the image bearers you would have us to be. We pray in the presence of Jesus Christ and we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.